Okay, welcome to this next session. I'm Mazarin Banaji. I uh, am in the psychology department here, and it's my great pleasure to um, moderate this session. Um, and also to begin by thanking Larry Lessig, the E.J. Safra Center for the Study of Ethics for having supported this work and these ideas. Uh, I very much hope that even though the lab has come to an end that uh, we don't assume that institutional corruption has. Um, so if you're looking for a good example to demonstrate that looks are deceptive, you need look no further than the human brain. Coming in on average at three pounds, this squishy lump of unattractive grayish jelly is the most complex machine that exists in the known universe. It gives rise to a quite remarkable thing called the human mind, which is the place of origin of all that is good and terrible in the world that is of our making. I used to leave hurricanes and earthquakes out of this, but I no longer can. The mind's output consists of simple things called thoughts and feelings. These appear in relatively simple forms, like little associations, but all the way to more complex propositional thought. They come in mild feelings, mild inklings of a feeling of, I trust this institution, I do not trust it, to very complex actions with consequential effects. Should I, the police officer, kill this man who is running away from me? Should I, a justice on the country's highest court, lend my support to gay marriage? What should I do? I, the Wall Street banker. I, the principal of a school. I, the independent scholar, the Catholic priest, the citizen. At the E.J. Safra Center for the Study of Ethics, the pro project on institutional corruption has included the mind sciences from the very first days that Larry Lessig became director. He felt that this science and the many labs from which new and exciting data were pouring out could be of interest to the center's work because it might overturn at least one prominent myth about corruption. And that is that there are a few bad people, and if only we find them and put them away, we will be rid of corruption. We in psychology, and in particular in social psychology, we do not deny that individuals vary in their propensity for and their actual acts of corruption. But our presence in this enterprise has been to analyze every minute movement of thoughts and feelings to track the roots of institutional corruption that lie in every single mind. So much good work has come from this project over the past five, six years, that the term E.J. Safra and the terms institutional corruption have entered the language and writings of mind scientists everywhere. Today, we're gonna to hear from two noted authorities on the psychology of institutional corruption. I'm gonna introduce the first one to you. Dolly Chug received her MBA from Harvard Business School and her PhD from Harvard University. In her PhD work, she began with a loosely termed phrase that was around, but with nothing having been done on it. The phrase was bounded ethics, to capture the idea that because human mind the human mind is not nearly as rational as the platonic view of it, that from it could emerge ethical decisions that could be compromised not be because people were intending evil, but because their mind's work was corrupted because of evolution, because of our biology, because of our culture and our history, because of our individual paths to, through life and the situations in which we find ourselves. Dolly has made this concept her own and demonstrated the many ways in which our actions are simply not in line with our own held values. Now, we're all fine thinking about others and other disciplines that are corrupt, and lawyers and business people receive the brunt of our attention. For this reason, Dolly got into some trouble, worthwhile trouble in my opinion, for daring to show the corruptions of her own tribe, university professors, making decisions about who is a worthy graduate student. This is just one strand of her work. For much else she has done, she has been named one of the 100 most influential people in business ethics by Ethisphere, and I'm proud to have worked with her while she was here and delighted to announce that she was recently tenured at Stern School of Business at NYU. Please welcome Dolly Chug.
I like the phrase worthy trouble. I'm going to borrow that uh, for the next time I get in worthy trouble. Um, probably will be next time. So um, I want to start by um, thanking Larry Lessig for this incredible uh, gathering and this incredible culmination of five years of work. Um, Katie Evans Pritchard for bringing it all together and making it work, and Mazarin for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, it's an ambitious group, and what I'm hoping I can contribute with my little piece to the work here is uh, an understanding of a puzzle that that I am just continually amazed by, which is how do all of us, all of us in this room, the regulators we spoke of, the lobbyists, the politicians, the lawyers, the justices, everyone we know, how do we so confidently retain a belief in ourselves and a view of ourselves as ethical people? That, that, that there is virtually none amongst us or anyone out there doing wrong who will claim themselves to be corrupt or unethical, perhaps until they're brought to stage uh, in the dock. <laughs> um, but usually at that point, there's been some sort of public catastrophe that has brought them there. So this curious coexistence between, between what, how we perceive ourselves and our intentions around ourselves and the reality, it's this gap that uh, we try to address in work that we describe as bounded ethicality. Um, bounded ethicality, the, the term emerges from uh, what, what probably most of us are familiar with, with bounded rationality, the idea that we have systematic limitations on how our mind works based off of its computing speed, based off of uh, how how much information it can hold. And the idea behind bounded ethicality is similar, that, that we have systematic constraints and that that is part of being human. It's an ordinary part of being human. Central to that idea is a bit of a challenge to the notion that the solutions or the, the, the key that's going to open up that puzzle I described lies in self-interest, that if we could only tamp down everyone's pursuit of their self-interest, we would be able to control this unethical behavior. What I'm hoping to, to put in front of us is that self-interest is not the whole story, that we want to um, understand what psychologists refer to as self-threat. And how is self-threat going to help us understand this puzzle and perhaps lead those of you who are um, oriented towards finding the solutions towards the solutions that will address the, the uh, self-threat issue. So let me say more about what I mean by that. Um, self-interest is the idea that we're trying to pursue something that's in our own uh, best interest. And a lot of the <sighs> ethics research, particularly the traditional ethics research, has implicitly and, 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 and almost tacitly assumed that self-interest is what's leading to our ethical failures. And so if we could only, for example, develop norms where people didn't feel it was OK to openly pursue their self-interest at the uh, cost to society, that that would, in fact, reduce unethical behavior. Or that when people are constrained by their regulatory resources, in other words, they're very tired, they're very depleted, they're cognitively loaded, this is when they're going to behave in un unabashed pursuit of self-interest to the detriment of others. So once again, self-interest is what's driving the behavior. But recently, there's been, oops, there's been uh, some more challenges and nuances uh, to this, 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 um, this view of self-interest being the, the sole driver of what's going on with unethical behavior. And here we start to see it is that perhaps this view rests on a rationalist approach that could be more nuanced. And the nuance will come if we begin to understand other aspects of what's driving our unethical behavior. 
And so uh, as Mazarin very nicely uh, took no credit for in her introduction of me, uh, with Mazarin and with Max Bezerman, we wrote in 2005 uh, some work building off of earlier notions on bounded ethicality. And I think that was sort of roughly bounded ethicality 1.0 1, 1 or 1.5. And, and then this amazing decade has taken place since 2005 in my field of behavioral ethics. There's been an explosion of research where it's, depending on who's counting and how you're counting, it's something like, if you look at scholarly research, scholarly publications, a five-fold, six-fold increase in the number of publications on this topic in management journals, uh, psychology journals, sociology journals, that the, the, the worlds I sit closest to. And from this amazing decade, we have learned so much I think we're now ready for bounded ethicality 2.0. And with Molly Kern, who's not here today, um, I have a working paper where we try to incorporate the key insights, the three key insights from this amazing decade. And so I'm hoping today to share those to you and build up to this argument around self-threat is where we're headed. Oh. I forgot to put the pictures. <laughs> yeah. So it actually, you know, I don't normally get I get sort of average nervous before public speaking, I would say. And today I was super nervous and I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized that I think that this is two thirds of my dissertation committee uh, on that. <laughs> and I think the last time I spoke in front of both of them was my dissertation. So I think I'm just having this uh, rebound to 10 years ago and just natural dissertation defense nerves. So, so I, I'm attributing it to that. Okay, so bounded ethicality 2.0. This is the uh, bulky definition. I'll give you a moment to process. And what I'm gonna do is focus on a few pieces of this definition. For those of you who have read about bounded ethicality in the past, the pieces that are familiar are systematic, ordinary psychological processes. In other words, these are patterns of behavior that we can trace back to how the mind works in ordinary ways, not a few bad people, but all of us sitting here are subject to these. Where we're um, building in this new version is in elaborating on the self-view and on borrowing research from uh, those psychologists who study the self and what they can tell us about how um, vehemently we will protect our self-view. And we, we will, uh, we'll see a bit about the, the uh, ways in which they can articulate that as I, I work through the model. So when I say model, um, we, we do have a working paper that like goes into painful death by PowerPoint detail on every arrow and every circle and every box. You notice I've left it unlabeled here under the assumption that if you wanted that much detail, you would probably be happy to read the paper, but that the rest of us probably aren't ready for that much detail right now. But what I'd like to do is this model that is unelaborated up on the screen captures a few of the features of the processes that we elaborate on in the paper. And I want to go through those features and how they have derived from this amazing decade and its three insights. So the first is this idea of automatic processing. So um, Mazarin was at the forefront of helping us understand that much of our mental processing is not occurring within our conscious awareness, that our deliberative and intentional mental processes are working side by side with a whole set of processes outside of our awareness and perhaps defying our intention without us even knowing. So what we've seen in recent years in the ethics literature is an explosion of work that's beginning to tip its hat to this idea that some of the, uh, some of the behaviors we engage in are not occurring in ways in which we intended. So for example, the first site up there by Scott Reynolds and colleagues, that in this work they talk about a, um, a, a reflexive judgment that emerges when we, without even intending to, search in our minds for an approximate prototype of a situation. And if that prototype that we um, automatically come up with elicits an ethical response, we will go that way. But if it elicits, for example, a profit maximizing response, we would be more likely to go that way. And so in work like this and others that are um, elaborated on in, on this screen, we see 
lots of ways in which researchers are beginning to pursue the automatic side of bounded ethicality. But the next frontier, the questions that remain unanswered, um, in some ways were questions that were asked in 1994 by psychologist John Barge. He had uh, these four horsemen of automaticity that he referred to, awareness, intentionality, efficiency, and controllability. Awareness means that I know I'm doing something. Intentionality means that I can start it when I want to. Controllability means I can stop it when I want to. And efficiency means the, the amount of resources required to engage in this process. So there's a lot of things we now are saying, and I think there's probably, based on the talks we've heard so far, the excellent talks, that there's a tremendous amount of buy-in on the idea that much of our engagement and behavior, um, for example, the campaign finance work, that, that even Rick Perry in that example perhaps would not have consciously realized and acknowledged himself as unethical in that situation. He would have, however, been exactly aware of what he was doing. He could have controlled it. But there are ways in which he's able to manage his view of himself as ethical in that situation. This is where we're hoping to get more precision as we go forward. And we're hoping our model will begin to help with is breaking down when we say something is automatic, what do we mean by that? Because something can be automatic and, and highly in our awareness, or something can be automatic and completely outside our awareness. And it's, it's from a psychologist standpoint, dramatically different processes that are probably at work in those situations. So one area, the next frontier, I'm hoping goes in, now that we've got this key insight around automaticity, is how is something automatic? The second is, which processes are more or less automatic? What exactly is happening that is or is not uh, described as automatic. So when we say someone is behaving through an automatic process, the reality is underlying that are hundreds of mental processes. What specific processes are occurring in an automatic way? The second big insight from this amazing decade, and this one has um, a, a ton of work emerging as we speak, is this idea that what happens now is affected by what happened before. Let me say that another way. That my moral behavior is more of a sequence than an event in temporal isolation. So for example, I'll use um, work on the dynamic moral self by Benoit Monin and colleagues. They've shown that if I behave in a, a non-prejudiced way, and then I'm given the opportunity a few moments later to make a decision in which I could behave in a more or less prejudiced way, having just behaved in a non-prejudiced way, I'm actually more likely to display prejudice on that second decision than if I hadn't engaged in that non-prejudiced behavior the first time. So the idea here is that what happened before, what I just did, has some influence on what I'm going to do. And in that particular model, there's some sort of licensing um, dynamic going on in which I uh, I have licensed myself by behaving in a non-prejudiced way to behave in a prejudiced way. There's lots of interesting work, as you can see up on the screen, different models and different theories that have elaborated on this idea that my behavior will continually and dynamically change based on what I just did before. And the idea here is that my self-view, this is where we can start to bring the self-view and self-threat in, is that what is happening is my self-view is continually being updated by each act I engage in. So my commitment to seeing myself as ethical, remember the puzzle we began with, that my commitment to seeing myself as ethical when I'm able to raise my view of myself as ethical, and then I have some latitude to move, uh, I have what uh, Dan Ariely calls a fudge factor to work with at that point. So we have a number of theories now that show that ethical behavior is in fact dynamic and that particular events at particular moments in time are affected what, by what happened before. Where the next frontier is with this work is that the good news is we have a lot of fascinating and really well done research. The bad news is, is the patterns don't always go the same way. 
So sometimes it goes like the example I just gave you. I do something good and then I do something bad to follow. But then we also see examples of when I do something good, it, it increases the probability of me doing something good next. So which is it? Good goes to bad or good goes to good? This is where we really need to untangle, and I'm hoping bounded at the Cality 2.0, where what I'm going to show you by the time um, the next few minutes unfold, will show you where we can we think unpack some of those patterns. And finally, the third insight from this amazing decade is cyclical processing. That this process that I'm describing, that's dynamic and automatic, is continually repeating itself. That we are constantly in the act of trying to retain a view of ourselves as ethical. This is, I think, one of my uh, favorite captures of how important it is to us to see ourselves a certain way, how central self-view is to us. Favorite foods, sex, alcohol, money, and friends, none of them beat me needing to see myself a certain way. And we have lots of research that says that the way I need to see myself is at least as ethical enough, at least as not a bad person. So the, uh, the idea that of me being ethical enough can manifest itself either as a desire to be good or a desire to not be bad. So you can imagine that I have a little more latitude when I only have to be not bad than when I am striving to be good. The question is, which do I go for? And this is where we're hoping we can offer some precision with our work. The, um, I'm gonna go here. The idea that I have this tolerance level and that there's a gap that I'm assessing between where I am now at this particular dynamic moment and where I feel I need to be in order to hold on to that committed commitment I've made to myself that I'm going to be ethical enough that we all seem to have made to ourselves. When I'm seeing very little gap, that's the situation we describe as low self-threat. That's business as usual. And in that situation, self-enhancement is the name of the process psychologists use to describe the business as usual. I'm just trying to continually tweak and iterate my view of myself as ethical, automatically, dynamically, this is not happening within with awareness, but I'm just trying to continue to see myself as being okay. On the other hand, when there's a high self-threat, when I feel I've been, it's been pointed out to me that I'm doing something that others would view as unethical, or it's uh, my, my previously held intentions are held in contrast to my current behavior, at this moment, I have great self-threat. I have a big gap to deal with. And this is the moment in which self-protection comes into play. The process of self-protection, now I am gonna, I am going to put the full picture up there. The process of self-protection is one in which, if you notice, when we go through these cycles of behavior of self-protection, I get pushed into moral awareness. I get pushed into considering decisions through an ethical lens and a moral lens. This is when I'm trying to fight off the threat and the negative self-view. On the other hand, business as usual self-enhancement occurs when I have that low self-threat and you notice I bypass the moral awareness. I'm able to view situations without applying a moral lens to them. So business as usual takes place on an ongoing basis. It's always occurring. It's happening to all of us right now as we sit in the room. It's a day in the life for us whereas self-protection occurs on an as-needed, episodic, event-driven basis. When my self-view feels threatened, this is when it kicks in. And so <clears throat> when we consider how these uh, patterns are occurring all the time, automatically, dynamically, and cyclically, we have an asymmetry that emerges between our behavior when we're in self-enhancement and our behavior when we're in self-protection. And we think this asymmetry begins to explain some of that research that I described that puzzles us, patterns going in different directions. 
So for example, in self-enhancement, where I have minimal self-threat, where I'm okay, business as usual, I continue to work in a fairly automatic way. My processing is occurring on an ongoing, continual basis, and I'm more likely to have blind spots. I'm more likely to not see the gap between my behavior and uh, my intentions and how others perceive me. This cycle will continue to go, and this is where um, my behavior is, is unlikely to be influenced by conscious attention or moral awareness. On the other hand, on the self-protection side, this is where there is some meaningful ethical self-threat, and here I am desperately trying to get away from any sort of negative ethical self-view. I need to be okay. And so here my moral awareness kicks in, my automatic processing dips. I'm now in more conscious and deliberative processing. I'm less likely to have blind spots. And so <clears throat> these patterns, when we put them together, set us up for different ethical responses, different patterns and processes that underlie how we respond to situations based off of the degree to which we feel our ethical self-view is threatened. Um, I'm gonna, I, I knew this talk was both too short and too long, I said, and I think this is the too long part. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go pretty quickly without describing some of the underlying studies here, but I just wanna say that there is some really interesting research that elaborates what goes on in that self-enhancement side for example, around blind spots, why we don't see what we don't see. Um, uh, Francesca Gino and Lisa Shu have done some fascinating work. Slippery slopes, how little small dips in our ethicality lead to even more dips in our ethicality in a very uh, gradual and unnoticed way. Again, on the self-enhancement business as usual side, this consistency that I described, that when I, um, on the self-enhancement side, this is where when I behave poorly, I behave poorly. When I behave well, I behave well. We tend to see cycles of consistent behavior. And then the self-threat kicks in, and this is what pushes me over to the other side. This is where my moral awareness reveals my blind spots, and it makes it more likely that at this point, I might move towards ethical behavior. On the self-enhancement side, the momentum is gonna push me gradually towards unethical behavior. I will, even if I start ethical, eventually move in the other direction. So I think the implications for practice uh, that, that I'm hoping we can all uh, work on in the coming years is that we want to be thinking about this role of self-threat, that because we are so psychologically nimble at retaining that ethical self-view, that under, under um, any, almost any circumstance we can see ourselves as good, that we have to realize that interventions that don't threaten that ethical self-view are rarely going to work, that we are going to be really, really capable at retaining our belief in what we do. So whether it's through formal structures and informal culture that can move us in a different direction and threaten our blind spots, whether it's through nudges that set defaults in ways that are, um, again, nudging us towards more ethical behavior, that these are ways in which we're uh, not dependent upon individuals seeing their own ethical behavior and on their own self-correcting, because everything within our psychology suggests we won't do that. Thank you very much. Very much enjoyed the opportunity to meet with you. Thanks. this presentation. Wow. Wow. I haven't heard you give a talk in a while. That was a wonderful summary. Thank you. Um, we are going to hold off questions until the end. So uh, both speakers will speak, and then we'll leave, we hope, a solid 20 minutes for interactions with uh, you. And I hope some of the questions that came up earlier can be discussed again. I, too, found the sociality question to be very, very interesting and connects very directly to some of the work in psychology and my own growing sense that we are not discriminating these days by harming members of groups other than our own as much as we are discriminating by helping those of our kind uh, and that that is nearly the same thing. Um, 
George. George Lowenstein is among the greatest economists of his generation. He received his PhD at Yale from the economics department, but he has the mind of a psychologist. Uh, he is at present Herbert A. Simon Professor of Economics and Psychology in the Social and Decision Sciences Department at Carnegie Mellon University. George has had an abiding interest in the cost-benefit trade-offs that happen when choices are separated in time, an issue that Dolly mentioned as well. Given that so many of our choices have their effects over time, saving for retirement, consumer choices, labor supply, George has challenged standard discounted utility models by infusing psychological facts into them. He has also studied why negotiations fail even when the conditions are all favorable, when our behavior will reveal gaps in empathy, empathy gaps that are also directed at our own future selves. Back to Dolly's point about how some of this is not necessarily even in our own self-interest. George is known for his support and work in neuroeconomics, on conflict of interest, on privacy and health. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been president of the Judgment and Decision Making Society and co-director of the Center for Behavioral Decision Research at Carnegie Mellon. Please welcome George. George Lowenstein. As Dolly uh, mentioned that two of her um, committee members are here, and I think I can trump that because uh, my mother is in the, in the audience. <laughs> and my, my mother is very critical, but we, we, we have a deal. Um, if she, when she comes to my talks, um, she never gives me honest um, feedback. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna talk about um, corruption and the, its relationship to competition. Just like a week ago, I came upon a paper by Benabou and Tirole on what they called um, bonus culture. It's a very fascinating paper, which I highly recommend that you get off of the web. And really, I think I'm talking more about bonus culture than I am about competition. So it's not just about um, competition, but also um, things like um, the, sorry. Um, <coughs> Con the various types of contingent payments that are becoming ever more popular. For example, um, t in teaching, we, um, teachers used to be mainly paid a salary, and now they are being paid um, contingent um, bonuses based on the performance of their students. In medicine, we have much more kind of micro -incentiviz incentivization of doctors and so on. So I'm really talking about a much broader phenomenon than just competition. Competition, uh, corruption has, of course, always been with us. I was just, I've uh, been reading um, Robert Moses, the, the um, Cairo book about Robert Moses. He talks a lot about Tammany Hall. So it's undeniable that corruption has always um, been with us. And who knows if it's rising. Probably every generation thinks that corruption is rising in its generation, but I think it's undeniable that corruption is spreading across sectors in the United States. So it's entered into um, teaching, it's entered into uh, medicine much more than before. It's also entered into academia. There have been a lot of well-publicized examples of fraud in academia, including at this institution. Um, corruption tends to be self-sustaining. When there's very few people engaged in corruption, it's much more likely you'll be caught, and if you are caught, you're, the sanctions are going to be worse. When everybody is doing it, the um, likelihood of being caught and the consequences tend to decline, and that produces what economists refer to as um, different equilibria, kind of a, a, equal, a low corruption equilibrium and a high corruption equilibrium. The, prom the problem is that once you get into the high um, corruption equally means very difficult to get out of it. It's kind of a Humpty Dumpty type of situation. So the, the question I want to address is the question of, um, I'm going to be focusing on one force which um, kind of helps to explain why we end up on one side of that equilibrium, the good side or the bad side. And um, the inspiration from this talk comes from a, a classic book from not, dating back to 1953 by a guy named Donald Cressy. <clears throat> it's titled Other People's Money. It's a remarkable study of the um, causes of corruption. 
And Cressy interviewed hundreds of incarcerated embezzlers, and he poured through large data sets collected by other researchers on embezzlers. And he subjected his um, extensive database to what he called negative um, case analysis, in which he systematically attempted to challenge his own conclusions. I think this is um, something that modern social scientists do too little of, and that we, we could certainly learn from Cressy. We don't have a tendency to challenge our own ideas, needless to say. And after um, engaging in this very extensive analysis, he concluded that embezzlement almost always has two components. And the first is an, um, what he referred to as an unshareable need for additional funds. And the second is access to rationalizations for behavior. And the second one relates a lot, very closely to what Dolly was talking about in her talk. So here's, a, here's his best statement of his um, thesis. Trusted persons become trust violators when they conceive of themselves as having a financial problem which is non-shareable, have the knowledge or awareness that this problem can be secretly um, resolved by a violation of their position of financial trust and are able to apply to their own conduct in that situation verbalizations which enable them to adjust their conceptions of themselves as trusted persons with their conceptions of themselves as users of the um, tr entrusted funds or property. Um, so really there's two, there's two components. There's the ability to rationalize and this other component, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Now there is a lot of research showing that the human powers of rationalization are prodigious. Some of the best research, in my opinion, um, comes under the heading of moral wiggle room, originating, originating from a paper by um, Dana Weber and Quang. And they look at a, um, a variety of different situations, and they look at people's ability to rationalize being um, selfish. Here's an example. Suppose that I face um, two situations. Situation A is a little bit better for me than situation B, just marginally better. There's another person who's also going to be affected by my, by my choice of situation A or B. And it's possible that for the other person also, situation is be, be, A is better than B. So our interests are aligned. But it's also possible that situation A is disastrously worse for the other person, and situation B is marginally better. Now, if you tell people you're in situation B, um, then that's the situation where um, there's a kind of a conflict between the two parties' interests. People will behave altruistically. They'll take, these, they'll take the option that's slightly worse for themselves to avoid imposing this huge cost on the other party. But what um, Dana, Weber, and Quang find is that if you give people the option of, de of finding out, are you in situation A or are you in situation B, they choose not to look, and then, they and then they choose option A, which is better for them. So they just rather close their eyes. They, they have another study showing diffusion of responsibility, which is a classic psychological phenomenon. The third one, I think, is devilishly clever. In this third um, study, there's a, um, that you have to act quickly. So um, these peop um, the people in the study, if they um, delay, they're going to end up imposing the selfish. They're going to get the selfish thing for themselves. They have to act quickly and push a button to get the thing that's a little bit worse for themselves, but not disastrously bad for the other party. But uh, it's just strange. Um, in this situation, they tend to get kind of um, leaden, leaden feet or a leaden finger, and they just somehow miss the deadline and end up with the option that is selfish, that is better for themselves and disastrously worse for the other person. Um, Roberta Weber, um, who was on the first paper, um, John Hammond and I have also um, looked at another related phenomenon. We call the self-interested th interest through agency. It's basically the phenomenon of getting other people to do your dirty work for you. So we look at a situation. If we pair two people, um, one person is called the dictator and one person is called the recipient, and you pair them and the dictator can decide how much of a fixed sum, let's say $10, to give to the recipient, dictators tend to be pretty generous. However, you, create, you change the situation slightly and you introduce an agent, and the agent is going to make a decision of how much of the principal's money to give to the recipient. And a, the, um, there are different agents, and what happens is if agents are generous on behalf of the recipient, they get fired, and agents get hired if they are selfish on, on, the, part of the, on the part of the principal, on the part of the dictator. So you end up 
when you introduce agents, you end up in a much more selfish equilibrium than when, you, when people are making these decisions directly. Um, a while ago, um, um, Dennis um, Miller was on the um, on this um, conflict of interest panel that I was part of in um, Washington at the National Academy. We were sitting through a long day of listening to people's um, testimonies, and um, at the very end of the day, a guy named Brian Palmer, president of the American Association of Medical Students, testified, and then one of the panel members. Um, asked a question. He, um, the panel member, his daughter was a medical student, and he asked, are you saying that my daughter, the medical student, is going to get um, corrupted by all these conflicts of interest in medicine? And Palmer gave what I thought was a very interesting answer. And it relates to, very directly to this concept that people are very good at rationalizing. He said, the training is difficult and people feel beaten down. They're overworked and they have got hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. You have an industry that is, this is the pharmaceutical industry that people he's referring to are the medical students. You have an industry that has figured out how to capitalize on that by saying, oh doctor, can we do that for you? You deserve it. It fuels an entitlement that we are all long for, that we are worth it. Then he continued, the only way really to rationalize accepting all, um, all this, these gifts from the pharmaceutical companies, is to say, I deserve it, or some version of that. So we find some rationalization for it, and then we adopt that rationalization to protect ourselves from what really is an uncomfortable position that I think some of us are feeling here today of, oh, the end result of that is yucky. Um, I love the use of the term yucky. Um, anyway, um, Sunita kind of and I pondered um, this statement from Palmer and we decided that it um, sort of provided the template for an experiment and that's what we did. We went to young physicians, 313 of them, and we randomly assigned them to um, three different experimental conditions. Um, in two of the conditions, we asked them questions about the hardships that they had experienced in their medical education. Did you have to borrow money to fund your education? Please indicate your average gross salary, how many hours of sleep. We're just reminding them of how miserable the medical, their medical <laughs> education was. A control group, we didn't ask these hardship questions until the end. With the explicit rationalization um, condition, these people, we also kind of hinted at them that these hardships could provide a rationalization. Some physicians believe that the stagnant salaries and rise, rising debt levels prevalent in the medical profession justifies accepting gifts and other forms of compensation and incentives from the pharmaceutical industry. To what extent do you agree or disagree? And then we asked all of them 10 different questions uh, oops, about um, do you think it's okay for a doctor to, to attend corporate sponsored continuing medical education sessions and so on. Ten of these different questions about basically how okay is it to succumb to a conflict of interest. Um, here are the results. Um, we, when we looked at the, ten, the answers to the ten questions, so how acceptable is it to succumb to a conflict of interest? Got to master this. When we reminded them of their sacrifices, they said it was more okay to accept gifts. And we, when we reminded them of the sacrifices and we actually implicitly suggested a rationalization by asking that extra question, they said it was even more acceptable. We observed a strange um, pattern, which is when we, we looked at people who said, who said the ra um, this, does ra this does rationalize accepting gifts, these hardships do rationalize accepting gifts, these people were very happy to accept gift gifts across the board. It was the people who D said that these rationalizations don't, these um, hardships don't provide a rationalization. These are the people who were actually influenced by the rationalizations, surprisingly. And you can see that here. We also um, included a, what we called a, a feel rich, feel poor manipulation. We wanted some people, some of these physicians to feel like th the hardships were worse than others. So we asked some about their annual salary on a scale that went to um, very little to 50K. Others we asked about what's your annual salary on a, um, on a scale that went up to 350K. We asked them about sleep. These people on a sleep, most people get more than three, and a half, three hours of sleep, so they all got lots of sleep. But these people, we asked them on a scale that went much higher, so most of them um, reported that they got much less sleep on the scale that we provided. 
And the idea was if we made them feel like their hardships were worse, they were going to say it was more acceptable to accept gifts, which is, in fact, what we observed, a significant difference. Um, so based on these studies that I've just told you about and many, many others, it is clear that the human powers of rationalization are pre um, prodigious. So Cressy's statement, Cressy noted that these embezzlers are able to find rationalizations, but in a way that's not surprising. The ability, if the ability to find rationalization is so ubiquitous, then that suggests it doesn't really help us to explain when and why corruption emerges. So again, we're left with the, old, this, the original question, when does corruption emerge? I think Cressy's second point um, is much more interesting and useful. The other part of Cressy, um, Cressy's point is that um, people become trust violators when they have an, an unshareable um, problem. In Cressy's period, that tended to be things like a gambling problem, maybe like um, an alcohol problem, a mistress, things like that. In today's, um, what I'm going to argue today is that um, Basically, what Cressy was talking about is if you feel like you're in a hole, if you, if you're, if you feel kind of trapped, then that is when you are going to behave um, corruptly. I was on a um, disciplinary committee at Carnegie Mellon. I, I saw a lot of cheating cases, and there were some students who were kind of inveterate cheaters. They just seemed to be kind of corrupt individuals. But um, more often than not, most of the cases seemed to be situations where actually um, the professor was not very good, and the, um, the criteria for grading weren't very, um, weren't very clear, and the student felt trapped. The, and the only way that they could get a good grade was by cheating. Um, and I think um, the generalization of financial problem, which is unshareable, is being in a kind of a state of desperation. And I believe that increased competition produces such a state of desperation on a wide scale. Um, and um, I, I wrote a paper with um, um, Scott Rick, uh, which is titled Hypermotivation. And um, in economics, you sometimes hear that markets are driven, or human behavior is driven by fear and greed. And um, greed is usually viewed as synonymous with self-interest. In this paper, we argue that that's exactly wrong, that greed is the antithesis of self-interest. It is motivation taken to the point of self-destructiveness. Why would someone be so motivated, so strongly motivated, that they become self-destructive, that they engage in actions that are bad for them, that might be bad for their family, or that violate their most um, cherished values? Um, well, we think that a theory that men, probably many of you have heard of, prospect theory from Kahneman and Tversky, provides an elegant answer. And prospect theory says that we always evaluate our situation relative to our reference point. When we're below our point of reference, the, um, our um, value function or our motivational function tends to be very steep. And, the, and this is a phenomenon called loss aversion. We're very, very, mo we hate losses. We're very motivated to eliminate losses. And so prospect theory says that um, we are going to be hyper-motivated when we're, we feel like we're in a position of loss relative to, for example, other people, our own prior situation, or, for example, what we think is fair. And so loss aversion leads to both increasing motivation or hypermotivation. And for you decision researchers, you know that loss aversion also leads people to be more risk taking. But I don't have time to explain that point. There's a lot of evidence that people behave unethically when they're below a subjective reference point. Taxation, people are more likely to cheat on taxes when they owe than when they are owed a refund. So keep that in mind when, you, um, when you're making decisions about withholding on your taxes. Um, lies, the vast, um, there's research showing that the vast majority of serious lies originated with bad behaviors and people lie to cover them up. Cheating, students who have ambitious goals are more likely to cheat. And I also I already talked about um, the case of cheating. How does hypermotivation relate, relate to competition? So Andre Schleifer, an economist here, um, wrote a paper titled, Does Competition Destroy Ethical Behavior? And he, wrote, he writes, this paper shows that conduct described as unethical and blamed on greed is, some, is sometimes a consequence of market competition. My point is to pinpoint the crucial role of competition as opposed 
to greed. My point is that competition, I agree with Schleifer, competition does destroy ethical behavior, but it's not an alternative explanation to greed. Competition produces greed. Competition leads to greed due to elevated reference points, and these include people one is competing with and also superior past outcomes. If you were in a sector of the economy that, wasn't all that, um, that was not all that co competitive, and it all of a sudden becomes competitive and you start feeling like you're losing out, that creates the situation of desperation of loss that leads to greed. There's a lot of evidence that competition and performance bay has intensified across diverse um, sectors of the economy. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna skip this um, slide because I want to show you some more experimental results. There's also uh, many different cases. The, re the recent Atlantic, uh, um, Atlanta school cheating scandal um, was clearly tied to the types of compensation system being offered by the Atlanta schools. Um, there was a scandal in the um, VA, which is again um, tied to screwed up bonus payments where they um, hid the long waits that veterans were experiencing waiting to get cared for. Um, there's a scandal of doctors who get cash from healthcare firms for patient referrals, um, soldiers receiving bonuses for persuading friends to sign up during the Iraq-Afghanistan wars. So often these um, examples of corruption seem to relate to either increased competitiveness within a sector or to bonus compensation, new, new forms of bonus compensation. So um, last thing I wanna show you is some experiments that we ran to kind of um, demonstrate these types of effects. This is with um, Leslie John, who's a professor up here at Harvard Business School. Again, Scott Rick and myself. It, um, the paper's titled Cheating More for Less, Upward Social Comparison Motivates the Poorly Compensated to Cheat. Um, I'm gonna talk mostly about papers that are, studies that are in the paper, but one also that's not in the paper. In all of the experiments I'm going to talk about, Subjects answered what, what we call a coordination question. For example, and the, the point of the question is you're trying to, trying to get, give the answer to the question that you think the most people gave. You're not trying to give the true answer to the question, you're trying to give the answer that the most other people gave. For example, name a bird that has long legs. Now, um, you might have thought um, stork, and you might say stork, probably not, but, um, and then, Later on, you discover the correct answer is ostrich, and then you say, oh, of course, ostrich. I knew ostrich. And so um, we, we, we deliberately chose an experiment where we thought people would be able to delude themselves that they really did know the correct answer, even though the answer that they actually wrote down on the paper was the wrong answer. <laughs> now, in this situation, people um, graded their own tests, hence the opportunity for cheating. They were paid in some fashion, which I'm gonna talk about, for giving correct answers. In some experiments, we actually collected their response sheets so we could see if individuals cheated, so we kind of cheated, but in other, <laughs> in other experiments, um, we just look at these scores. Here's the first um, study. We manipulated um, whether they got um, five cents or 25 cents for each correct response, and we also manipulated whether they were, uh, whether, whether they were aware that there was a different pay rate that they could have received. So for some people, we basically think of their, us, their, us as flipping a coin to decide whether they are in the five cent per um, correct response condition or the 25 cent condition. For some people, we flipped a coin before they walked into the experiment, then they, and they don't even know, if, if they're getting paid five cents, they don't know that there's a 25 cent condition. For the other people, they would walk into the experiment, we'd tell them that there are these two conditions, we'd flip the coin in front of them so they knew that they were in one condition but they could have been on the other condition. And here's what we found. When they were un unaware of the other condition, then people cheated more when they could gain 25 cents from cheating than when they could gain five cents from cheating. It was worth more to cheat. But when we made them aware of the alternative condition, then people cheated more when they were in the five cent condition than when, than when they were in the 25 cent condition. It was like they were down and they, uh, they wanted to make up their, their losses. Very consistent with what I've been um, telling you. In a second experiment, we, again, we paid people for their correct responses. There were three conditions. They were unaware of the alternative pay rates as in the first study. 
In another one, um, there was local equity, so everybody was in a classroom, and the classroom was assigned to get five cent or 10, 25 cent compensation. And in the third one, there was local inequity, so every individual in the classroom was assigned to either get five cents or 25 cents. And here are the findings. What we found was it seemed local inequity seems to make a big, big difference. So in the five cent condition and the local inequity condition, people cheated a whole lot more than in the five cent condition than in the 25 cent condition when they knew that there were other people in the same room who were getting the other pay rate. Um, I, in, the third, in the third experiment, um, we either gave people per, um, no performance on only their own, we gave them feedback only on their own performance, feedback on their own and other people's performance, or feedback on their own and other people's performance, and we only paid people if they were above the median score for a round. And here's what we found. Just telling people about how other people are informing seemed to put them in the hole and, and they cheated more. But when we told them they would only gain if they were in the top half, then they cheated even more. Um, and they also thought that other people, if they cheated themselves, they also believed that other people were cheating. In some um, competition, um, the argument I've been making is that competition or this bonus culture, as Benabou and Tarol express it, leads to hyper-motivation or greed, and greed itself leads to corruption. And corruption then leads to this bad equilibrium where, it's inex where it's, you're unlikely to get caught, the consequences aren't so bad, and people also think that when they um, cheat that other people are cheating as well. It's, so the, maybe we could call that the four horsemen of corruption. <laughs> Academia is not exempt, um, and um, Leslie John, Drajan Prelik, and I have, um, and many others have done research documenting the prevalence of cheating in academia. And I think I'll, um, I'm out of time, so I'll just stop there. Okay, so please line up at the microphones with, with your questions, and we have a good little over 15 minutes to, to do that. Um, any hands up? So while people are thinking about what to ask, um, oh, we have a question. Okay, go ahead. Hi, first of all, fascinating session. Um, this is the one I was looking forward to most, so thank you for not disappointing on that front. Um, uh, with the previous speaker, uh, one of the things that really we work a lot with in my work, which is actually politically applying these ideas, is that corruption is not a, a place where everyone's bad. It's where good people do bad things thinking it's normal. And so looking at this self-threat concept and the self-preservation concept, I'm thinking about how to politically apply that. And so how can I go to politicians and drive down their self-preservation, like, right. create self-threat, so that they feel that they have to engage in moral awareness again? And I think the best explication of that was when Nancy Pelosi got on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and he was like, it's corrupt on both sides. And she was like, no, it's the Republicans, not the Democrats. And he's like, no, it's everyone. Yeah. And she was like, no, it's not. And we're all like in America, we're like, dear God, it's that bad. You know? So what can we do to drive up self-threat? I think I'm not going to exactly answer your question, but I'm going to say that um, one of the worries that I have about this whole line of research and the idea that good people do bad things is that um, suppose that you're doing something bad and you keep hearing this message that good people do bad things, right. that helps you to justify no, it. Was. If you hear about the Milgram experiment and you hear that um, almost everyone gave these potentially lethal shocks to other people, then all of a sudden monstrous behavior seems much more normal, much more excusable. So I, I think we social scientists are in a quandary where revealing some of these patterns runs the risk of making them seem more normal and making people feel less bad about actually engaging in them. But, but that's not our history. If you look at something like violence, we use higher and higher standards now for what we call violence. It's not like, you know, so foot binding nobody called violence. But when you call it that, you are identifying something that's much more ordinary. And I think our history shows we're largely going in one direction, that we're including more and more things as being unethical than we ever did before. And, and so I don't, I don't quite, quite agree, but, but I guess you may have data showing that we're, we're, we're in some way devolving the, the notion of 
uh, what corruption means by simply making it ordinary. I think making it ordinary is step one, but then to be horrified by the ordinariness is the next step, and, and, and I think uh, we, we do that, I guess. I, I actually uh, yeah. think that yeah. what you're talking about can have a perverse effect as well. Mm -hmm. um, calling more and more things violence. Mm -hmm. For example, um, the term um, survivor used to be used to refer to people in concentration camps, and now it's, being refer it's used to refer to ever, um, ever increasing populations of people are becoming survivors. And I, th I think that's, it's da it's, that's a dangerous trend also. Yeah. also. Yeah, all right, well, we, that's a, a different question of just what, what language uh, does, and in fact, there are two sides uh, t to this particular issue, but I think that if we point out that there are ordinary acts that we used to assume were completely morally acceptable that no longer are, I don't think we're lowering standards, we're raising them, and including more seems to me to be going in the, in the direction that I think is, is, is the right one. But in any case, let's take more questions to the two of you. Actually, by the way, Dolly, did you have an answer to that question? Because it was about <laughs> this question. It was, a, I think it was to you. I have an answer to that question, but it, it struck me as another version of the reformers dilemma that we heard about earlier. There it was, you have to be in the system to fix the system, and here it's you have to make Everybody understands something's ordinary in order, in order to make it not okay anymore. So, mm -hmm. pardon me. So, yeah, could you say who you are? Hi, I'm Christopher Robertson. I'm from the University of Arizona. Uh, I wanted to ask about the interaction between law and ethical behavior uh, through the lens of psychology. In law schools, we we start indoctrinating our students from the day first day of of the first year that law has these functions of deterrence uh, as well as expression of a social norm. And perhaps there are other functions as well. But I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts about whether law undermines or uh, supports ethical behavior and how. Uh, sure. Um, well, I think, I think um, sometimes laws can certainly um, create um, norms and reinf reinforce um, norms of behavior. Because they kind of they say this has been deemed by the society to be society to be unacceptable behavior, but um, in situations where um, people don't really buy into the laws, then um, the laws themselves become um, discredited. They have no force, and then they, they end up not reinforcing the norms, and and that's a risk. And I, this actually goes back to the debate that we started to have when the society becomes ever more punitive and more and more things are um, considered to be um, illegal and unacceptable, then um, the law itself becomes, um, I think, kind of de undermined and uh, the, the, the moral um, normative standing of the law. I think where I, I, again, don't have an answer to the question, but where I find myself <coughs> puzzled, and I know we, we've talked about this, uh, Max, Mazarin, and I, is how do we deal if some if somebody is doing something that is imposing harm on others but they don't realize they're doing it how do we in a legal system hold them responsible for that you know so there's the drunk driver analogy of um you know person is drunk therefore obviously not thinking clearly imposes horrible harm we still hold them accountable because um, they made a choice uh, to get behind the wheel in that circumstance. I don't know if that carries over into behavior that is occurring outside of someone's in intentional awareness in the ethics field. So I, I have always taken the position that if you're not aware, uh, that you ought to be held differently responsible than if you are aware. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm told that there is a volume uh, put together in philosophy on implicit bias and that 11 of the 12 chapters on responsibility argue the opposite, that whether you're aware or not, uh, you are responsible in, in, in some way. And uh, so I look forward to reading them and changing my mind. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Solomon Khan and I'm a network fellow at the lab and I uh, work at a paperless post, which is like a startup company in New York. I have cool. a question on bounded ethicality and also a question on corruption. 
Uh, within bounded ethicality, ethicality, how often does that self-preservation instinct uh, result in people closing themselves off to moral improvement yeah. as opposed to opening them up to moral improvement? And then um, as far as uh, corruption and competition, it seems like uh, on the chart there I saw that in the study where it, you know a whole bunch of people were in the same room and some people in the room got paid five cents and some people got paid 25 cents, that the 25 cent people actually seem to have cheated much less than in the previous examples. So has there been any work done uh, along that line of you know, having people who you know, are, have more successful putting them closer to people who aren't successful as, uh, as a method of, of sort of improving their non-cheating? <laughs> Can we take uh, the first one? Sure. OK. Yeah. So I think the first one's uh, quick. If our theory is right, then in the self-protection mode, it actually reduces the chance of me being closed off to learning, that I'll be more open to learning in that mode than in the business as usual mode. And, yeah, on the second point, that, that's a very interesting observation. I hadn't even no noticed that uh, myself. But it certainly, it, it certainly is in the data that the um, people who got the 25 cents and they were aware of the 5 cent people did um, cheat less. I don't, um, and does that actually um, point to a possible social remedy of making people who are more fortunate, like uh, making them more aware of the fact that they're more fortunate? I would um, wonder whether that would be really very applicable in the real world. And this goat relates back to the point about rationalization. When people are in an advantaged position, I think in the real world, um, as opposed to our experiment, I think they're pretty easily able to rationalize why they are in, a, in an advantaged <coughs> position. And so I doubt that being in an advantaged position would make people much less likely to cheat in the real world as opposed to the lab. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm name? Steve Kaiser. I'm a graduate of MIT, and I have three degrees in mechanical engineering. And the worst professional situation I ever encountered in ethical terms was when I was a student. I was working in a laboratory doing uh, materials research. When do materials fracture or break under a contract with the Navy? And the professor in charge had all these fancy equations and we put everything onto a computer to figure out how to predict when the material would break. I ran the experiments and found that one particular material broke and his equation said it would never break. I immediately went to my professor and said, my God, there's something wrong with the equations. And his response was very quick. Oh, we have too much money invested in the computer. We can't do everything over. So that was the end of it. He didn't change his recommendations to the Navy. He didn't fix his equations. And I was utterly shattered by that. I didn't want to become a mechanical engineer ever again. Somehow I stuck with it. But it's an interesting question. Suppose you were there as advisors to me. What would you recommend on how I should handle that situation? <laughs> <laughs> Can I? OK. Well, let me say two things. In the situation you were in, the, um, your advisor had a financial interest in his theory being um, correct. But in many, I mean, you don't need that. In academia, uh, people become very attached to their theories. And even, without, even when there isn't an obvious financial stake, they are um, going to be, they're not going to believe results that go against their theories. But I think um, there's something even more uh, pernicious, which is at, at least your professor did the experiments that could, that could and uh, in fact, in your case, did discredit his theory. Um, but in many situations, I think um, academics are um, in a position where they, uh, I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Like it's like a drug company doesn't want to test for side of, like bad side effects of the drug and academics don't want to subject their theories to tests that could refute their theories very much. And th this relates back to the comment I made about Cressy and his negative case analysis. Too few academics, in not only in the material sciences, but also in the social scientists, sciences, subject their um, theories to kind of tests that could be disconfirming. 
uh, to you, I would just say that there is a panel that you'll be interested in on whistleblowers. Um, and that panel may have something to say to you. Okay. Um. Uh, my name is Xiao Gaodeng. I'm from UMass Boston. I'm this year's a fellow. Uh, I have a question that study corruption in China. The, the, my question is, it is these, the boundary of the motivation. You have these officials, you know, for instance, recently three president of hospitals, each person have 100 houses. And you talking about houses expensive in Boston, you have to be in China. <laughs> and uh, you know, you look, what kind of a sh shabby houses can, can, can worse. And uh, you know, most, a lot of them are, you know, can probably spend the next 10 or, or, or 20 generations, the money, they still can not use it. So could you elaborate, you know, two professors, you know, why this, you know, of course, you know, for I mean, sociologists, the only thing is, is a Merton theory strain, and I want, you know, to, to, to elaborate more from, you know, psychological, this kind of about the why this, of course, you know, the environment, you know, that kind of things, so, yeah. So, so the question is how do those three individuals sustain yeah. their, yeah. this belief that this is okay? I mean, it's, see, that's the puzzle. I mean, that, that to me is, it's actually, I suspect, really easy for them to psychologically maintain the view. Um, moral disengagement, that, that's work that says if we dehumanize the people who um, our, our actions impact, um, if we distance ourselves from them, that these are all ways in which we can make our actions appear okay to ourselves. It's actually remarkable the gymnastics we can do automatically, cyclically, and dynamically, where I don't think it takes, <coughs> let me make it even worse. The thought experiment is if any three of us were in that position, I bet we could also be okay with it. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can have only one of you answer, and let's see if we can get more questions in. So let's do a few more, yeah. Yeah, my name is Bruce Skarin. I'm a data scientist and private contractor. And I recently heard about an interesting insight about the criticality of private voting in reducing voter intimidation and voter fraud, vote buying. Um, and how we use that in our general election, but it's not used in like liberative bodies where it's really important. Mm. I was wondering from a you know, psychology perspective, what is it about, it's important about some degree of privacy in decision making as opposed to like this kind of ever more drive to have increasing transparency. Um, how, how does that kind of relate to how people are influenced in make decisions? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't actually think you need psychology to understand why privacy and voting is a good thing. Because in, in organizations, um, if, you are, if you don't have power, somebody else has power, and you vote against um, the other person, you're, you know, there are going to be consequences for you. And so, yeah, again, I think just economic standard kind of economic um, theory ha has a pretty good answer to that. I do think um, yeah, pri um, transparency certainly um, does have its limits. That's just um, one of many examples where transparency doesn't provide solutions or even ends up backfiring. Um, this is not specifically about your talks, but you're such uh, evidently such uh, insightful psychologist that I, I take the opportunity. Uh, why does money uh, so corrupt? Money is a very abstract thing. How can it have this immense psychological effect? Well, the secondary reinforcer. Money, money is not the only thing that cor corrupts. Um, you can think of all sorts of other different types of gains that corrupt, but the. The mis uh, mon there's a mystery to uh, money. Like um, maybe money corrupts more than other things, but um, I think what we're finding more and more is that uh, money has become a not a secondary. In economic theory, uh, money is just a means to an end, a means to consumption or a means to um, leisure or whatever. But what we're what we're now finding is from neuroscience and other types of research. That money has a, it's a primary, it's become for us a primary reward. 
So when we, even just hearing that you've won money, you immediately feel good or bad. Light it's up. not, yeah, it's not at the moment when we spend the money, which is what economic theory would say. And so I think the answer is, um, why does money corrupt? I, um, I doubt if money corrupts uh, more than other types of things that we value, but the fact that it corrupts as much as the, these other things is consistent with the idea that money has become a primary reward in human society. We are out of time, but I want to take one more question, so go ahead. <laughs> Jane Mansbridge, a uh, teacher over at the Kennedy School. Um, I wonder if, if you go along with the link I'd like to make between this micro-corruption and in, in, what we, institutional corruption. If we have a low equilibrium in which everybody is corrupt and a high equilibrium in which no one's corrupt, it's very hard to, hard to get from one to the other. Um, couldn't a set of laws that we, have, we perceive ourselves to have made as citizens have a greater effect on those climates than a set of laws in, that we think are being de uh, deeply uh, corrupted by special interests, for example. We know that high percentages of the American public say special interests are creating our laws. So we don't perhaps have a sense that the laws that say you're not supposed to do this are our laws. Mm -hmm. right. Possibly if we had that macro sense that these laws were our laws, self-given, we would be more likely to stay in the non-micro-corrupt equilibrium. What do you think? Do you see? I, I, I don't think I fully get it. I, I do. I think I do. Okay. Um, okay. And, I, and this is um, perfect because it allows me to um, also address the um, question from the Chinese gentleman. Um, because I, I totally agree with, with what you say. When people don't feel like they are in, tra in charge of the laws, then, they don't, then they, um, the laws have less moral standing. And I was just in China. And there's a big, big anti-corruption move in China. For example, the last time I was there, we would have these sumptuous banquets, and like there'd be tons of food left over. But now um, there's an edict that coming down from the central party: no more, um, no more food excess. And it's all, there are all sorts of different anti-corruption regulations that are similar to that. But when I talked to individuals about that, they were unbelievably cynical about those anti-corruption regulations, and everybody said, oh, there's a pa some kind of a power struggle going on in the center, and people, then some people are using these anti-corruption measures as a means of moving aside their enemies. And so I think that's a perfect example of how um, laws that, aren't, that don't come out of um, some kind of democra democratic um, system, but are just kind of passed down, <coughs> don't have the same kind of moral standing are less likely to create real norms. I, I wish we could go on, but I just want to thank our two speakers again, and thank you all for your questions. <laughs>